welcome to the penultimate talk of the Jane Austen Society's 80th birthday celebration. Um, joining me on Zoom today are Professor Janine Barkas, who is the president of the North American Friends of Chalton House, uh, Professor Jenny Batchelor, who uh, lectures at the University of Kent and is also a patron of the Jane Austen Society UK's Kent branch, um, and Susanna Fullerton, who's the president of the Jane Austen Society of Australia. Um, so welcome, ladies. It's a real pleasure to have you all here today. Uh, we're really lucky, I think, to be able to record this conversation stretching across time zones uh, from the UK. UK, where Jenny and I are, uh, to America, where Janine is, and Australia, where Susanna is. Um, so thanks for joining us at very uh, varied times of the night and, and morning. Um, it's a global reach, I think, for an author who's often associated with the local. Um, and today it is the local um, in this session that we're going to be thinking about. So we've called this session Our Chawton Home. Um, and it's a, it's a kind of strange medium, really, to be having this conversation. Um, it's a virtual conversation, but it's one about a specific geographical place, um, about specific material objects um, and the role of two uh, literary heritage houses in the village of Chawton in the way that Jane Austen continues to be read. So I hope that what the session will do in part um, is to help those who cannot get to Chawton uh, to picture or to remember it. Um, and I also hope that visits, of course, become increasingly possible as the world opens up again. But it's nice to have this um, online virtual opening up of the world here. Um, so I'm going to uh, jump straight in um, with our first question. What has been your most memorable visit to Chawton? Um, and Janine, I'd like you to, uh, to open with this. Um. The, I think my first visit um, was made memorable because it was accompanied by a busload of uh, undergraduates from the United States, from Texas. And I think that any kind of, of first um, is either intense because you, you, know, you do it alone and you get to kind of uh, transport, be transported um, uh, back to when you were reading, or you're a parent or a, a guardian, or in this case, I was a guardian of a busload of, of students, and you're a teacher, and, and you somehow have to, you know, keep, keep a po face on and and pretend that this is absolutely normal and so you can't kind of have that giddy transporting experience when there are a whole bunch of undergraduates uh, who are doing that instead and I think my most sort of the visit was made memorable because we had brought yellow roses for Yellow Rose of Texas, and we put them on the graves of the two Cassandras at St. Nicholas Church, and we walked from uh, the Chawton House, uh, then Chawton House Library, to the cottage, and when the cottage opened, uh, the students went in and then dispersed in the gardens, and um, and it was actually, yeah, a conversation with the gardener at uh, the cottage uh, that was, for me, sort of the most kind of memorable. I don't know if it's worth relating in its entirety, but sh this was a gardener who had posted an open letter. Um, uh, uh, and, and I've been there a number of times with students, so I might be mixing up whether this was 2004 or whether it was another date. Um, but I remember the students asking whether or not they could take some of the pieces of lavender uh, that were in the wheelbarrow filled with lavender uh, that she was cutting uh, and putting on the compost heap. And uh, she was delighted that there were all these students, you know, somebody who's taking care of plants and who, uh, who felt uh, clearly later on, she and I had lunch, you know, on the ground. She was having her sandwich and I was sitting down and, and she was commenting on how polite my students had been. I said, well, you know, this, this is sort of the cottage and this is Jotun. And, and um, she said that, uh, you know, sometimes people take cuttings um, or want to take flowers and then press them into, you know, a copy of Jane Austen. And, and so that there, she was constantly returning to the garden and finding little, their little heads cut off. And here she would have been cutting and uh, the students was kindly asking her whether or not they could take a little twig uh, home. And that idea of a pilgrimage and wanting to take something real home with you, you know, and we have gift shops for that um, impulse and, you know, more power too the gift shops but that 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 I found unbelievably endearing in my students who um, you know, occasionally annoy one um, but there that that was the the experience that they were having that said they got it 
and that they they too thought that the geographical location that we were in was special and that traversing all of those locations gave them uh, a kind of deepening sense of um, both the not just the, the 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 universality of Austin that we had already experienced on the page but the 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 Austin on location. Mm -hmm. I think that's fascinating the students kind of taking um wanting to take a piece home um uh, yeah, yeah authentic piece as well i think um yeah i've seen people do that in, at chalton house many many times um, yeah susanna well i had a very memorable visit to chawton cottage when i was actually on my own in the house just with tom carpenter it was after hours so the house was closed to the public i was on a visit over from australia with my family they all got sent off somewhere else for a few hours and Tom took me through the cottage and he said touch whatever you like so I did I opened every cupboard I sort of put my hands on every surface uh, he took me into all the different rooms of the cottage those that were open to the public and those that were not and then he took me into his kitchen because he was living in the cottage at the time he had a, a few rooms in there and he said Susanna close your eyes and hold out your hands so I did that and when I opened my eyes the two topaz crosses were sitting there in my hands and that was a really moving moment for me uh, to feel that I was holding the necklace that Jane Austen had worn around her neck was was very special indeed uh, I also got to see the great house at, at Chawton uh, at the time when they had just started on the renovation work and uh, Richard Knight uh, took me all over the house, which was amazing. Uh, this time with husband and, and three children in tow. And we went up to the attics of the house, which are not usually open to the public. And one of my boys had a tennis ball with him and he dropped it. And it just rolled down the slope of the attic floor. It was so crooked. There. there was a straight line in that house. And the children were absolutely fascinated because they'd never been in a house that had such crooked floors. Uh, so that was an exciting moment for them. But like Janine, I have taken many tour groups to, uh, to both places, but particularly to Chawton Cottage. Uh, not students in my case, but adults. So I've been leading literary tours for uh, about 20 years and I've taken many, many groups to the cottage. Now, some people, it's a repeat visit, but for many, it's a first visit. And I just find it so incredibly moving to see the emotion that people experience by arriving at what is not the most beautiful house in the world. The cottage is, is not a particularly beautiful bit of architecture, but it just means so much because of those novels that came out of it. And I've seen, you know, elderly women with tears in their eyes that they have managed to get inside Chawton Cottage and see where the novels are written. They do lots of spending in that gift shop and the bags that come back onto the coach are, uh, are many and, and large. Uh, but no matter how many times I, I go back with different groups, uh, I find people notice different things. Some love the garden, some love the uh, you know, they find the kitchen fascinating because that's all been open to the public more recently. Uh, they, they love standing in that little parlor, uh, seeing the table on which the novels are written. And to see all these different people responding in different ways to the, the cottage is, is incredibly special. And then I walk them up the road and we go to the great house and uh, uh, we do a tour of the great house and uh, last time a garden tour as well and we saw all the, the wonderful quotes that are now there in the garden including the um, chosen by the Jane Austen Society of Australia uh, so no matter how many times you go back it's always incredibly special but I think that time when I was just there on my own really has to be my highlight. Mm. Jenny do you have anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's very hard for me to pick a memorable visit. I don't even know how many times I've 
been to Chawton, except it must be in triple figures now because I used to work there. Um, so I mean, but I think when I first went, when I was 15 years old, and I, I must have nagged my dad for about eight weeks to take me to where Jane Austen's house was, and he did take me to his credit, and I and I had a lovely time. I really really enjoyed it. But in a singular lack of failure of imagination on my part, I didn't actually walk up to the church, so I didn't see Chawton House. I just saw the cottage, which was all I wanted to see at the time. Um, so I suppose really my most memorable visit was actually seeing Chawton House for the first time which I only did because um, I was being interviewed for a, for a job there um, and it was it was it was a sort of a, an informal chat before I went for the formal job interview was which was at the mu much less um, picturesque surroundings of the University of Southampton um, which you'll be familiar with um, and I remember for well, the first thing I did was I drove into Chawton and of course I can only orient myself in Chawton around Jane Austen's house so I managed to drive into Chawton and then drive back out of it before I realised that I hadn't made the right turn to get to Chawton house so I had to drive back into Chawton <laughs> and then went down to the house and it was the go it was going up the drive it was going up the long long drive up to Chawton house seeing the, the carriage circle at the top um, at this point that Chawton house was was still a renovation project um, and so as I went in, you know, it was very much a hard hat zone and it was, um, it was a very surreal experience actually being inside the house at that point. But it was that move from, for me, it was the move from Jane Austen's house to seeing Chawton house itself. And I suddenly thought, oh, that's what it's all about with the houses. I get it now. Like, you know, being able to situate the cottage, which I felt so familiar with even before I'd been to see it, you know, as a, as a 15 year old, but being able to situate the house, its size, the size of the rooms, it, its its look in relation to the big house, the big house that Edward spent some time in, but you know, he really rather preferred to spend more of his time in Godmersham, of course, you know, and, and seeing the relationship between the two houses, which was a really um, wonderful experience for me and, and a really enlightening um, experience for me too but I, but I mean like both Janine and Susanna I've also done lots of tours within Chawton House I've seen I've seen those um, wonderful emotional responses that people have when they walk into particular rooms and think gosh she may have been here before me and just how affecting that can be and I suppose my other most memorable moment actually now I come to think about it was um, a conference that I helped to organize back in 2003 when Chawton House opened as Chawton House Library back then we had about 250 people at that event. It was extraordinary. It was partly at Chawton House. It was also in Winchester and um, at, at the University of Southampton. And frankly, I was shattered because we were, this was, we had about a two week opening for the, for the library and many, there were many hands on deck, but we were all working so hard. And I took a, a breather for about 15 minutes and sat on the lawn at, outside the front of Chawton House was sat next to a, a, a lady I, I hadn't met before. I looked at her name badge to find out who she was. I didn't recognize her name. I didn't think we'd been in email correspondence. And we, we struck up a conversation. And it was somebody who was in her 70s, who had read and reread Jane Austen since the age I started reading her, really, about the age of 10, I seem to remember. And she was American. And she had got a passport for the first time simply to go to Chawton and be at that conference and be there for the opening of the library. And it was such, um, it's, it's one of the happiest conversations I've ever had with anybody, was speaking to, to, the, to, the, to this woman who had for the very first time on her own, got a passport, travelled outside of her own country just to be where Jane Austen had lived and spent time. Um, it was, yeah, really wonderful experience. Yeah, I think it's lovely to meet uh, pilgrims and, and yeah, to, to see those reactions. I mean, you know, we show people into the lower reading room at Chawton House and I love people's reactions in there, um, usually to, to the kind of the smell of the books and it's, it's one of my favourite uh, kind of parts of the job, really. So I, I suppose that leads quite nicely into the next couple of questions. One of them's about items that are held at Chawton House and at the Jane Austen House as well. Um, and so we're interested to know what your favourite item would be so Jenny you work on material culture and um, let's start with with you yeah that's also what makes this a really horribly difficult question to answer this is like the worst test I've ever done because trying to limit it to two is really difficult but I'm going to be sneaky and pick one item from Jane Austen's house museum and one from Chawton House if I may um, so for, for, for Jane Austen's house museum I think oh again it's really really hard but I've become but I, I think I'm going to pick an object which um, 
yeah I'm going to pick an object which we think is Jane Austen's as with so many as with so much Jane Austen, Jane Austen stuff we're not entirely sure it was hers but there is a wonderful delicate gorgeously embroidered Indian whiteworked shawl which Hilary Davidson has done some wonderful work on and you should go go read Hilary's um, work work on the shawl because it's really really wonderful family legend has it that Austen made this shawl and you know if her nephew James Edward Austen Lee was right we all know she would have put a sewing machine to shame that she was excellent at the satin stitch and by gosh you know if if she if this is her work if this shawl was her work he was not wrong I mean it really is absolutely stunning the beautifully delicate white worked crosses are absolutely gorgeous um, so I mean that that's one thing that I would pick it, it's a it's a wonderful object Paula Burns written about it wonderfully as well and I think it's it's just something that encapsulates uh, well it, it's I think what I like about it really, apart from my own sort of interest in Jane Austen as somebody who was, uh, well, good at everything she turned her hands to, whether it's writing novels or, or, or engaging in embroidery, is it's that sort of promise of intimacy, that sort of sense that, you know, if this was her shawl, it was made with her hands and that sort of, that sort of, um, yeah, as I said, the sort of promise of intimacy that that, that object creates, which I find really, really seductive. Um, even though we're not quite sure whether it was hers, we can't be fully sure. I really, really love it. Um, but the other object I'd like to pick, if I might, is a book. Um, again, it's not one that Jane Austen held in her own hands, but nonetheless, it's 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 a the title of the book is certainly one that she could have held in her hands, and it's a book in the Chawton House collection called Millennium Hall, which is a novel by Sarah Scott. Now we know that there was a copy of that novel in the Knight family collection um, at one point because we have the Knight family catalogue from 1818 that says it was there but I believe it's one of these lost sheep books that we don't we don't know where it's gone um, and hopefully it will turn up one day but there is nonetheless another copy of this wonderful 1762 novel by a fabulous writer called Sarah Scott in the collection and I think like the, like the collection of books in Chawton House more generally I, I, I one of the things I've always loved working with that particular collection is thinking about the books that Austin may have read the books that may have influenced her and helped her become the writer that she became because of course you know whilst she may be our favorite writer of the 18th and 19th centuries she and much as her genius it, her, is not uh, is not exaggerated by any means she doesn't come from nowhere and i think the debts that she wore both explicitly and implicitly to the women writers and the male writers who came before her are really important and millennium hall is one that really interests me because it's a it's a novel which is about a community of women who come together to work together um, to um, find imaginative ways of living and being in the world really is what that novel is about um, and I'm really I'm again like the shawl I'm sort of seduced by the the prospect that this is something that that knowing that knowing that Austin may have read that novel might take us a little bit um, closer to thinking about um, the kind of things that she was interested in and preoccupied by as a writer and of course both Jane Austen's House Museum and Chawton House are organisations that have thrived because of not just women, but a lot of women coming together to make these places thrive and survive. And so, I, I yeah, that, that book has a lot of resonances for me. Janine, what, what about you and your favourite items? Um, well, to uh, follow up the um, Protestant nunnery uh, desire, um, <laughs> I, um, I, the items that that really affected me were were not specific items at all because as Jenny indicated so many of them sort of like they may have may have not things on the shelf uh, the shelves in the closet the you know the, the the bedpan is not really the it's for me it was never about that for me it was about seeing the pub for me it was about oh my god she lived across from a pub I mean it just and of course the pub is named for the gray friars it, it just history was just just hits you in the face when you're walking uh between the two houses and realizing that it's about the geography it's about the experience of um i mean Suzanne is right the architecture of the cottage is really nothing to write home to an architect about um and the tudor nature of of the great house doesn't belong to our era uh, the fact is it's a living and breathing place where people live and it was the life aspect of it it was the changeability the fact that um 
you know, Austin was influenced by history and books and events, and that she was in the middle of this riding in the, you know, walking between these houses and going to church alongside a road that must have been the main road between Winchester and London at the time. It was so busy that the, the one of the windows is still bricked up uh, by, uh, you know, the request of the women in the cottage in order to keep things a little bit more private and quiet. And the fact that you can still see that there's a bricked up window. Um, I think, I mean, if I had to pick an object, if it's not the pub, it's the bricked up window, um, or, you know, the graves that you can visit of the sister and the mother, uh, the two Cassandras, that it's, it's about the history in which you're standing. It's not, for me, the individual object which you can see in any museum. You know, Morgan has some lovely artifacts of Jane Austen and her writing and her books. Those can be moved to another place and you can commune with those objects somewhere else. But it's about being in that location. Chawton is this special, um, pilgrimage place for us. And by Chawton, I don't mean a specific house. I mean Chawton, the whole thing, the whole kitten caboodle. And that comes with a road and, you know, bad parking situation and it, and the, the, the sort of getting lost, where do I turn right or do I turn left? And the styles and the walking and um, it's, yeah, for me, it is that. It's the location itself and everything together uh, that 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 kind of conjures the the moment in time uh, that that we then pick when you know for those years that she was living in the cottage and walking back and forth and um, probably babysitting a lot of nieces and nephews. <laughs> and to see the the cottage that Miss Ben probably lived in, and to think of poor Miss Ben whose life was really a very tough one in so many ways. But I've always envied Miss Ben because she was there on the night that Pride and Prejudice arrived. And she sat there not realizing, or maybe she did, that Jane Austen was the author. And she was really the first public audience of Pride and Prejudice. And, and I've always envied Miss Ben that amazing moment. So you can just sort of, as Janine says, in that space, you can... You can see Miss Ben sort of, you know, putting on her shawl and trotting along the road to Chawton Cottage uh, to sit for an evening with the, the Austen ladies and having that phenomenal privilege of listening to Jane Austen read her own novel. Uh, so, yes, it, it's, it's wonderful to just walk around Chawton and see it in different seasons of the year uh, and picture Jane Austen, who, of course, as we know, loved walking, um, busy going around that, that space. Mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting that you both sort of talked about, um, I guess, kind of imaginative work that you do um, when you go and visit a place like this where you're kind of overlaying what actually exists. Um, yeah, with a kind of imagining of, of what it would have been like. Um, and also, I think that idea of the history being within the structure of the geography. Um, I went to um, the village of Steventon uh, quite recently, actually. I should have gone way before. And I just think just seeing that valley and there's nothing else there. So it's there where that imaginative work, I think, is the most acute. Um, and it's also, yeah, I think it is, it's interesting that there's the sort of space left for us in some places to do that. Um, whereas in others, I mean, as you say, Janine, there's the, the road is no longer busy it's now this kind of beautiful bucolic village that's very quiet and what people imagine I suppose a village in Austin would be like but of course it, the actual history was slightly um slightly kind of uh, different okay so let's move on to the next question then how important are Jane Austen's house uh, and Chawton house for an appreciation of Jane Austen's novels um Susanna maybe you could start us off well, I've been to probably hundreds of writers' houses in different parts of the world, from New Zealand to Australia to Scandinavia, France, Italy, Canada, the USA. Uh, so, and I've taken tour groups to these houses. And, and it is fascinating to compare what different places uh, do in the way of presenting writers' houses. Uh, now, I think you get very different categories. If the writer was incredibly famous in his or her lifetime, then things are kept. The house is left pretty much untouched, as if the writer has just popped out to do some shopping. Uh, all the items are there on display. Very, very little has changed. 
And so it's then very easy, I think, to imagine the writer in that space, uh, working, dining, getting on with, with ordinary life. Uh, Rudyard Kipling's home of, of Bateman's in Sussex is an example, and, and Longfellow's house in, in Cambridge in America. Uh, the writers were so famous in their lifetime, everything was kept and there is masses on display. With Jane Austen, of course, as we know, the house was uh, in other hands for many years before the wonderful rescue job took place 80 years ago, uh, and it was properly saved for the nation and turned into a, a museum. Uh, Mr. Carpenter had a bit of a, a shopping list of items that he wanted to get into the house because, of course, there was none of the original furniture um, by that time. There was, there was very little that had uh, survived the various occupants of the house and, and items had been dispersed. So her house is a very different case from, say, Kipling's or, or Longfellow's. Uh, I think the society and, of course, various donors have given things and Recently, Kelly Clarkson giving the, the turquoise ring. Uh, I have a, a replica on my finger. Uh, <laughs> and so, the, you know, there are new things that, that are still arriving at the house, which is absolutely wonderful. But obviously, the curators have had to, you know, bring in pieces of the era. Uh, the piano is one example. It's not Jane Austen's own piano. It's a piano of the era. Uh, I think they've done a fantastic job, and uh, it's it's really great to um, visit the house, of course, and to see what they do have on display. Uh, people visiting a writer's house, I think, all go with very, very different expectations, and so much depends on how much you've read of the writer. Uh, it can depend on the tour guide that you have when you're there and how they can manage to bring alive uh, a particular place. Um, that, that can make an enormous difference. Uh, and of course, the, the presentation and how things are presented to the public also matters enormously. The cottage has gone for sort of big information boards on, on walls with things about the brothers or uh, you know, her relatives or, or whatever, uh, and have made the most of the items that they do have, like the, the Wedgwood China, for example, and, and the topaz crosses, and, uh, the shawl that, that you mentioned. Uh, so I, I think considering that they started from a fairly low base when it came to ownership of, of Jane Austen items, uh, they have done a really wonderful job. And, and it has changed and displays have changed and improved a lot from when I first visited. Uh, over the years, they, they have got, you know, they've, they've really presented it very well to the public. Uh, and the Great House, of course, is a completely different matter uh, because its function was as a library. Uh, so that, uh, that made it rather different. It's not a typical writer's house uh, in the way that the, the cottage is. But people do find these spaces incredibly impressive. But I think my feeling is that I take so many people there who are sort of in love with it almost before they get there because it's Jane Austen's house and therefore it has to be wonderful and they know they're going to love it and they're going to be moved. Uh, it, it's also very interesting to think about what should go on display in a writer's house. Uh, I know that some writers' museums think very carefully about certain objects. Evidently at Howarth, they do have Charlotte Bronte's corset but they don't feel that that's something that really ought to be on display. It's just a bit too intimate. It's um, perhaps slightly distasteful. Uh, at Agatha Christie's home of Greenway, one of the things on display in, properly in situ is her portable mahogany toilet seat that she used to take on all of her archeological trips. So how much of an author do we want to see when we go to a museum? Do we want to see their corset, their underwear, uh, their toilet seat, some of these perhaps more intimate items? Uh, so whether the Jane Austen cottage has things that they haven't put out on display, I'm not sure. But it, it does make you think about how much we want to see uh, of an author's life and where the boundaries perhaps ought to be drawn. So uh, lots, lots of interesting thoughts, I think, when you visit a writer's house as to how things are displayed, how much is there, how much of it is genuine, 
And how much does it just matter being in the space? If you go to Elizabeth Gaskell's home in Manchester, that's a very new literary museum. Uh, and obviously they don't have a great deal of her furniture. So there's a lot there that's sort of of the era. But it's still really special to visit Elizabeth Gaskell's Manchester home and to think of the novels that are there. So I think a large part of it is sort of psychological. You're, you're going prepared to be fascinated and pleased. And so long as the displays are, are reasonable, then the chances are you will be pleased. But I do find it really hard to judge the Jane Austen cottage uh, at all impartially. Uh, to me, it's, it's the mecca of all literary visits, and I, I feel deeply emotional every single time I go. So I don't think I'm a very good impartial judge. I don't I think I'm going to be impartial for um, for this audience, perhaps. Um, I was actually interested there, though. I mean, you talk about how much we want to um, see of specific authors. Do you think it's a gendered thing as well? I mean, would you say that the, the male author houses are, are, are different, are differently set up, and are there different objects on display? Uh, yes, probably. I can't think of any where loose sets or underwear are on display, but, but items of clothing often. I mean, there's a real dispute about um, Ibsen's spectacles. There are three different pairs and three different museums, and they all have completely different prescriptions. So which is the genuine pair of Ibsen's spectacles? And of course, each museum claims that theirs, theirs is the, the, the genuine object. So... Yes, it's, um, you know, they, they still, I, I don't know that there's a vast world of difference between male and female writer museums. Janine, what do you think? Um, I, uh, I love uh, uh, the comments that Susanna just made about how an author who's famous in his or her lifetime uh, can be kind of preserved in amber in a way that must be reconstructed by later generations if if the author rises as Austen did and, and of course that same is true for Shakespeare who became famous 200 years later really and and Austen too although almost continuously read is is now sort of at the height of her fame where it's sort of like oh what are we building now in order to lock that in and um, I went to um, the territory of the enemy, Mark Twain's house, um, and I Which had uh, oh the one in in um, Connecticut near um, yeah yeah, and it is I'm sure you've been there too. Yeah. Um, I was there by myself on a winter day doing a lecture at Trinity nearby, and and I took you know a cab what seemed like the middle of nowhere and uh, landed in this house. I was the only person there that day and had a private tour. And after a while I was deemed safe and was left to my own devices to go around the room. And so it, it was one of those behind the scenes kind of experiences that um, I've had at Chawton House, at the Great House, only because I got to stay there um, and at the stables and kind of see the sun go down and, and that experience is made. But Mark Twain, it's as if he just got up and the meal still left on the table and the pool table still has his pipe almost smoking on the edge of it. Um, and for someone who isn't a Mark Twain expert, that for me, that was a peep into that world that I hadn't ever asked my mind to fully conjure in that way. Uh, whereas I agree with Susanna uh, that those of us who make the pilgrimage to the cottage and to Chawton and want to see that world in situ um, already bring our own prejudices with us and we, we already have it fully in our mind and we just want to make sure that it's correct which is a different kind of experience. It's, it's for, I think, I feel that as a, I'm, I'm not a great Mark Twain fan, but I'm appreciative, um, you know, barring a few little things he said about Jane Austen. Um, and in that, um, in that way, I felt I wasn't really being asked to do anything of any work of my own. 
uh, when I came to the museum. It was done for me and I was appreciative, but I was kind of a passive recipient. And I feel that every time I bring students to Chawton, every time I visit, um, it, I have to do a little bit more work. And in a way, um, I, I appreciate that. It's not Disneyland and it's not done for you. You, you have to read the signs and remember passages and walk through the landscape in a much more active way, uh, like a walker rather than a sitter. I think that's interesting as well, because every time you read the novels, presumably you're getting something new as well. You know, you're a different person for every, every reading. So you're solidifying old readings, but also kind of maybe thinking about um, new, new ones as well. Um, Jenny, do you have anything to, to add there? I suppose the one thing I, I mean I agree with everything that Susanna and, and Janine have just said and I too appreciate the kind of the, the the imaginative work that we're required to do because it's not being done for us by the material archive that um, that's been left really I mean there are some wonderful objects but 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 not the kind of surfeit of objects that we have for other um, authors but I think for me so when I when I first visited Jane Austen's house museum it was part of a bigger sort of um, initiative on my part I went to I went to West, I went to Hardy's Wessex I, I had was going to a bit of a D.H. Lawrence phase so I went up to his place I was in I was in the Lake District as well um, and of course one of the things that I think just dimly occurred to me back then but I've become sort of increasingly preoccupied by I suppose since is the way that you, know, you don't have to go to Hardy's you don't have to go to Hardy's home to feel like you're in Hardy country when you're in Hardy country um, Whereas you, you know, you drive from where I live in Surrey uh, into Hampshire, and you see you see the signs telling you that you're in Jane Austen's county, and but of course her novels are not Hampshire novels in an obvious sense, in the way that Shakespeare's plays aren't obviously Warwickshire plays in a in in that way either. But I think, but the thing about the Jane Austen's House Museum in particular, I think that I, that I that I find so striking is, in a way, it it could be entirely empty. It could be entirely empty in some way, shape, or form, but nonetheless the idea of home I mean we all know Jane Austen is the novelist of home that famous famous expression which we can all we can all have a, a big long conversation about what precisely that means and it clearly means very different things to different people but but nonetheless I think you know that that experience of bricks and mortar and the difference between bricks and mortar and home and what a home means and what a house is and what being at home might mean are so critical aren't they to Jane Austen's novels that I think for me, that's always been one of the really important experiences of, of going into the Jane Austen's House Museum. She led, she led a fairly peripatetic life, of course, for so many years. And yet this, that, you know, that, that house, Chawton Cottage, is where she finished, revised or wrote from scratch all of her novels. I mean, it's, it's so, it, it needn't have anything in it for us to appreciate that and to see the kind of value in that. And that's, what I, that's partly what I think what I was getting at with my sort of when I first went to Chawton House and trying to describe that experience and suddenly seeing the contrast um, not just in my mind's eye, but physically seeing the materiality of the difference between a cottage on your brother's estate and where he got to live some of the time when he felt like that was a good place for him to be. And I said, ah, yes, I mean, we all, we, we, we all know how deeply her, her novels are preoccupied with these questions of home and houses and where you can live and having the means to live and how, how little control many women in particular had over the question of finding a home and being at home. So I think um, for me, that's one of the very special things that comes about actually visiting these properties, even if they were entirely empty, I think they would still, <laughs> they would still be valuable in, in, in helping us to think through those questions of home, which I think are really so important to her novels. Thank you. If you could meet the founders of the Jane Austen Society, so Dorothy Bell, Elizabeth Jenkins, uh, etc., what would you say to them? Susanna, shall we start with you? <laughs> Oh, well, a massive thank you, because it takes uh, energy and drive and hard work to get something started. Uh, and, you know, I, I know from running the Jane Austen Society of Australia for over 20 years how much work and energy is involved in starting projects within the society. So I just feel an intense uh, sense of gratitude that they made that effort, they started a society, other societies have copied around the world, and I think that's so exciting. I think uh, the society, JASNA was, was the next big one, and then JASA, the Australian one, uh, and there are now societies in, gosh, Spain, the Netherlands, Italy, uh, 
Japan, Singapore, uh, India, uh, and I think the list, uh, um, Denmark, uh, the list yeah. just goes on and on. So they not only preserve the house and help to get it functioning as a uh, one of, well, I think the most important museum in the world for me personally, uh, but they started Jane Austen societies. Mm. And I know from my own experience what an enormous amount of pleasure being with like-minded Jane Austen readers can give. Uh, and uh, as Miss Bates said, it is such a pleasure when good people get together and they always do. And of course, in a Jane Austen society, they always do. And joining a Jane Austen society has completely and totally changed my life. So I think that's what I would tell those founders, that they did something that is still changing lives and enriching lives 80 years later. So my thank you would be capital letters, underlined, lots of exclamation marks. <laughs> Um, ditto to what Susanna said, and I would say, you know, keep calm and carry on uh, to them. Uh, 1940 was an extraordinary time, and the world was upside down or about to stay upside down for quite a while. And the idea that the society was founded for the purpose of securing the cottage, which then wasn't secured as I understand, for seven years, um, that yeah, that the, these women saw beyond the the difficulty of um, of the current national circumstances, the current global circumstances, and looked to literature and that legacy uh, that Susanna just described as 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 the hope um, that kind of Dunkirk spirit uh, is extraordinary, and yeah. Keep calm, carry on, and so must we. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, I just echo everything that um, Susanna and Janine have just said. I mean, it, it would be too easy, and it would be glib and somewhat crass to make comparisons between 1940 and and what's going on in the world right now, for instance. But nonetheless, I think there is something about moments of of crisis, dif different kinds, different scales, uh, different magnitudes of crisis that are that are um, very clarifying, I suppose. And one of the things that, of course, we're realizing now in our own moment is just how desperately, desperately we need arts, arts and heritage and how valuable they are and what comfort they can bring, what community, as Susanna's describing, they can bring in between generations, single generations and, and, and in successive generations. And I feel I feel that those those women uh, who, who founded the Jane Austen Society, they, they saw that back then. Um, I feel that remembering that not just for their achievements, but sort of um, taking heart from that and 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 using that as a way to galvanize ourselves now to ensure the future of these institutions at a time of crisis is incredibly important um so yes a huge thank you to them and I, and and um they will continue to inspire us hmm. seems like a yeah a really positive uh note to um to end on so i'll say hmm. thank you very much for uh being part of this conversation it's been lovely to um to talk to you all and to hear your thoughts uh, on the Jane Austen Society um, and on the village of Shorten as well. And I really hope that everybody um, listening will be able to at some point visit or to continue to be part of the community um, digitally as well. It's, 